Now we continue with Professor Jorge Soto and Gai, who's going to talk about quantum cognition in everyday day life examples. Yeah. Something? Yes. Cognition like. Uh, yes. Uh, quantum like cognition quantum. in everyday life. Yeah. Some examples. So. I I will, in, in, in the meantime, let you know that uh, we will have, after this talk, we will have a very, very short coffee break while we set up a lecture, the last, the final talk that will be given by streaming from Canada, by Nora Bowman. She's going to talk more about the social science part. Uh, so we will have a very short coffee break because we are a little bit super delayed. So, we will make a short break. Okay. Well, so, uh, thank you for the invitation, first of all. And, um, well, this is intended, intended as a soft talk, uh, different from other talks in which we are, I just intend to give some examples of quantum light cognition in everyday life. And this is joint work with Alexandra and Daniela, who are psychologists. And, um, ¿Se escucha bien? ¿Ah? ¿El puntero es que se quedó ahí? I'm just looking for uh, some examples. Yeah. So, uh, as you know, maybe uh, mathematicians tend to say that it is more, it is easier to build up the theory from examples than to guess the examples from a uh, far out and abstract theory. This is the Ruskin viewpoint as opposite to French viewpoint. So, um, I'm more interested in examples, and I would like to cite a couple of recent work. I became aware of only a few months ago, or a few weeks ago, like uh, Ehatz Zotso Lelos on the quantum nature of identity in human thought. And the other one is an interesting attempt by two expert mathematical educators, one from Manchester and the other from uh, Simon Fraser University, which is called the Quantum Mind. I will comment that a bit to give you a flavor on what uh, people in mathematics education are trying to do with that. So, uh, let me begin by uh, citing a rather old paper by uh, Jean Laurent D'Alembert. This is 1754. Uh, the paper is called Croix ou Pile, which means head or tapes at the encyclopedia. Well, he was one of the creators of the encyclopedia, so I guess he did in the paper, didn't uh, go to a, a blind peer, blind referee. Uh, so there, he considered the tossing of two identical coins that you cannot distinguish. And he claimed that the three observable results of the experiment, which are two heads, two tails, and different were equally likely. So he happily assigned probability one third to each. And uh, his uh, contemporary mathematicians, fellow mathematicians, were not very happy. And actually, he was harshly criticized for this blunder by Bertrand and Pierce. Uh, Bertrand, I think, said that when it comes to probability, uh, Mr. D'Alembert's way of reasoning goes completely astray. And well, everybody knows that in fact the probability of, that, of having different uh, uh, size on the coins is 2 over 4. And you can check it, of course, you can experiment and convince yourself you, know, you don't want to, uh, to make any uh, theoretical calculation. Um, so in particular, D'Alembert predicts that his two coins will share the same state with probability two-thirds, which is a bit weird. And so on, for three coins, this would be two-fourths, 
and for end coins, end coins would uh, share uh, with all the uh, uh, heads or tails with probability 2 over n plus 1, which is uh, uh, surprisingly high. And it doesn't fit the uh, exper uh, experimental reality. But I think everybody in this room would recall uh, both the Einstein statistics for uh, in uh, factory mechanics and recall that uh, particles who obey this, uh, uh, follow these statistics are called bosons in order of subject to not uh, bosons. And bosons have uh, a tendency to share the same state uh, uh, with unusual frequency. So they just don't behave like coins. And uh, this uh, led to the uh, making of uh, Bose, Bose Einstein matter condensate some time ago. I think uh, this uh, earned the Nobel Prize for their makers. And uh, so my claim is that bosons, in fact, should have been called the upper cost. Because the Lambert really had a, a premonitory insight on the quantum behavior of a couple of truly indistinguishable uh, objects before the advent of quantum mechanics. Now, uh, this comment, I think, uh, I haven't found it really in the literature. Usually, people speak of, uh, in English, of uh, Donald Bell's blunder. But in fact, here in Chile, uh, you see, uh, here you have a textbook, uh, or a mathematics textbook for grade 10 from uh, 2004 by Gonzalez and myself, where we comment this. Uh, 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 well, it's in Spanish, but it's easy to understand. Uh, El error premonitorio de la Lambert, probability and quantum physics. So actually we commented this for uh, uh, secondary school, and uh, so we uh, have this uh, drawing made. You see a hand tossing two kinds and a hand tossing two bosses, two atoms. This should be, for instance, cesium, cesium atoms, which are bosses. And the text explains more or less the same thing I have uh, just commented. So this would be a first example, and I think it's interesting from a cognitive viewpoint how. Uh, more or less pure mathematician uh, can have uh, an insight uh, on quantum behavior. This is a positive uh, uh, way of looking at the Donald Bell's blunder. Now, uh, a simple example, uh, we call that a case of cognitive uneasiness. And the story is the following. Uh, this appears when we shift from one metaphor to another in uh, mathematics education. Um, so what we do is in our teaching, uh, at the University of Chile at least, we use uh, a lot of situational seeds for situational germs, instead of giving the student task, as in America. Um, so one of them is the parents of a fly, which is in fact a life and death process. And the story is the following, at minute uh, zero, a fly enters the room, the classroom, surreptitiously, and the teacher starts trying to kill it with a fly sweater as soon as it alights somewhere. Now the fly flies uh, each time for one minute approximately before landing somewhere, and then the teacher strikes it with the sweater. But succeeds only once in every two trials, on the average. So uh, probability one half that the fly is uh, killed. Now, if he fails, the fly will wing its way for another minute before alighting somewhere and going through another killing attempt, which succeed, succeeds as likely as it fails, and so on. So you have there a process that uh, might be potentially infinite. And a variant of this is when the teacher runs out of patience after four or five failures and puts out an, an ecological insect killer spray 
to terminate the flight. So you have the truncated version of this life and death process. And we have now questions. Uh, the idea is we just uh, suggest the situation and see and wait for questions to emerge. Of course, uh, there are many questions emerging. One of the most popular are how long will the fly lie? And life, which is the life expectancy of the fly? An important uh, datum for fly insurance companies. <laughs> And the students in small random groups uh, tackle the problem experimentally, theoretically, or metaphorically. And we have here some images. Um, in fact, they also simulate, and so they uh, end up studying the expected waiting time for it when tossing a time. And this is the one typical drawing they make. So uh, they draw a tree. This is the truncated version. Um, th this was an impatient teacher. And in fact, if you look at this, you may see this as a hydraulic tree in which you pour one liter uh, water at the top, at the apex, which bifurcates fairly at each uh, bifurcation. And so it's very easy to compute the amount of liquid you will be getting when the liquid drains. And in this way they can solve all sorts of tricky problems. How uh, likely is that the fly will live uh, more than three minutes or exactly four minutes and so on. But what is interesting is that this sort of tree suggests a random walk. So a different metaphorization. And uh, what we uh, noticed, uh, as I said, this uh, what we had recently was a pedestrian metaphorization, something like an ant's random walk on a tree, let's say a wire tree. And what we have noticed is that mathematically inclined students just jump over. Uh, a tr some tricky point in this uh, uh, um, transfer between one metaphor and the other. And uh, on the other hand, humanistic students feel uneasy about what we have just said, that the process is equivalent to a random walk on a tree. Uh, so instead of the life and death tree that we had before, they draw, we, are, we notice that they draw something else, which is a bit uh, funny. I uh, show both images now. So you have the life and death uh, tree again. And some uh, students who will major in psychology, sociology, law, they draw something like that. Which is a bit funny, they have sort of, there is sort of collapse. The left branches, well, I forgot to mention that uh, M is uh, death and V is life, is muerte y vida. And so, what's happening there? We notice that uh, never a uh, mathematics student has uh, any problem with this tree on the left. And so, uh, to try to find out, we had an idea to ask a couple of students to enact in a, a synchronous way uh, both processes, the random walk and the life and death process. So, one student enacts uh, the fly and another student enacts the end in a uh, synchronic way. And what happens is that uh, the student who uh, enacts the ant has some trouble because what does the ant do while the fly wings its way during the first minute? The fly is uh, buzzing around and so the ant doesn't know what to do. And several ideas emerge. Uh, some students uh, suggest that the ant become a fly 
freezes and then jump or soars in the air. And now we made an experiment of uh, asking an uh, American astrophysicist in Berkeley about this uh, problem. And after a moment's thought, he got the idea that the ant behaves like a Schrodinger's cat, which was our idea too. And the students uh, eventually converged to the same. Some of them say the ant crawls along the midline, or better, some say that the ant crawls uh, along both branches of the same at the same time, and then concentrates in just one. They do not say collapse because they are not really used to quantum mechanics. Uh, according to the outcome of the fly killing attempt. So um, one could ponder that a bit and claim that some sort of quantum behavior emerges when you try to force a synchronous translation between two metaphoriz metaphorization. And um, what is interesting to us is that mathematically inclined students, they, they just jump over this. They don't see any problem. And only humanistic students have, have, have had this sort of uneasiness. Now, um, I will go to a third example. I will comment... Um, what about my... Fine, I will drop. ¿Cuánto tiempo me queda? 10 minutos sí. para los 45. Sí, para los 40. Ah, yeah, ok. Sí, no, no, no. Well, um, so, uh, in this work, um, the authors address, among other things, the conjunction fallacy, and um, the underlying idea is to replace a set theoretical setting of classical probability by a geometric setting um, which is reminiscent of uh, quantum probability in which projections, you have projections instead of intersections. And so um, I will just show a couple of images because a crucial role here is played by non commuting projectors. Well, I have forgotten this is the title. Quantum light approach to conjunction facts. Sorry. And uh, you have the famous linear problem they consider. This is, um, this is from Tversky uh, and Kahneman from 1983. And Linda is a very one year old single. Uh, he, she is outspoken and very bright. She majored in philosophy and she was deeply concerned as a student with issues of discrimination, social justice, ecology and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Now, the question is, uh, is Linda more likely to be a bank teller or active in the feminist movement and a bank teller? And what happens, uh, according to Tversky and Kahneman, is that 90% of the people say that it is more likely that she is a feminist and a bank teller, which is not uh, very coherent with classical probability. Um, so uh, here is one uh, attempt of my uh, math education educator colleagues. Uh, the idea is to think in terms of uh, uh, wave uh, uh, function vector, uh, state vector for feminist and for non-feminist, this is F and P F, which are supposed to be orthogonal. And then you have to place psi, which represent is a state vector for Linda. In the first case, it's more likely that she is feminist, and this is another uh, choice, it's another prior, which is part of the model, uh, a decision to make. So in the second case, it's not likely she is a feminist or not. Of course, the probabilities are the squares of the antigens. So you, you get three-fourths, one-fourth, and one-half each. And now, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the description of the whole situation, in which you have first there, um, 
pero con el otro que salva al mouse este funciona sí debiera ahí está por ahí está so you have here the state vector and uh, you have the, the eigen vectors as I say are uh, corresponding to feminist and non-feminist so you place your uh, they place the state vector then you have a bt is bank cheddar and this is non-bank cheddar and you project first to get the probability that linda is a, fe is a feminist you project onto that uh, axis onto that vector you get this and then you project onto the bank cheddar vector state and you get that and you see um, that um, this, uh, you compare then this amplitude to the one with the one you get if you begin with a state vector representing linear state and you project immediately onto bank cellular state and you see that the amplitude is less than the previous one so this uh, simple toy uh, geometric model sort of accounts for this weird way of reasoning uh, regarding the fact that Linda is both a feminist and a bank trader. And here they compare with the projections the other way around. And this is interesting because it uh, gives some hints about intersection, set theoretical intersection, uh, non being commutative in the quantum version. Because in the quantum version, this is composition of projections which don't commute. Uh, are the same plane? Um, are there four orthogonal axes or there are two sets of orthogonal uh, axes? Both it seems that this is one plane and this is another plane. And and this is one tricky point because they put both planes in three-dimensional space. We are discussing that. This is discussion in progress. Eventually it would be maybe better to have four-dimensional space. And the point is that you have several ways to carry this out. This is just one way that you would eventually criticize. Of course, criticism will come. I just wanted to show that as an example of an attempt, um, which is interesting but may uh, allow for various variants. And um, so I go to the next. What's the one? It is frozen. Okay. Now, a variant of Linda is some exploratory experimentation with it. Um, we ask people to assign weights to the fact that the Bible Belt U.S. citizen, <laughs> you know, the Bible Belt, Tennessee, Missouri, or Louisiana, and so on, be racist, be isolationist, or both. And we did this with, um, with non-mathematically trained people and we got results like 50, 40 and 60 percent which is incoherent with Kakumagodian probability. So they, pro they estimated that the Bible by American would be both racist and isolationist with probability 60 percent. Now you can try to explain this with a geometric toy model but I would just uh, like to finish pointing out that you can also uh, suggest a fitting model because actually it seems that the subjects are assessing the fit between, between those sets BB, Bible Belt, Racist and Isolationist and this, uh, uh, this fit is estimated by those ratios of the intersections with respect to the um, environmental uh, asset so, uh, looks like our subjects are estimated converse probabilities or densities. So, maybe I will just make a drawing here. If you imagine, let's say, those are racist American, American citizens. These, those are, uh, sorry, is isolationists. And here you have, you may have Bible Belt Americans. And you see 
uh, regarding den densities, uh, what happens is that if you look at the density of Bible Belt Americas um, within uh, isolations, is this this part, which is not so big, and if you look at the fit of uh, Bible Belt um, Americas. Uh, among racist Americans, this is also not, not so big. But if you look at the uh, Bible Belt American in the intersection, in the intersection which is this, Bible Belt American are uh, all that. So the density, if you look carefully, the density of Bible Belt Americans is higher in the intersection than in each of the uh, uh, individual sets. And the same happens with Linda, um, the idea yeah, is that uh, the density of Lindas among bank tellers is lower than the density of Lindas among bank tellers who are feminists. So one uh, uh, variant of the interpretation of the model is that people are following uh, densities instead of probability. And in turn, they are thinking in terms of fitting. And one could say that they are reading likelihood of belonging from right to left instead of reading it from left to right. Well, this suggests uh, as a speculation, that there might be some non-obvious connections between corners, classical probabilities and quantum probability. And I think I will stop here. Uh, those are some of the references, some of them I already mentioned. And so this would be a drawing where you can uh, allow, this could allow for an alternative interpretation of this sort of reasoning. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Soto Andrade. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. I have a bunch of questions, but I will discuss with you later because it's very interesting what you present for me. Questions? No questions? Good. Then I can ask one question. <laughs> uh, so how would you represent the classical, like, let's say something that follows classical probability within this uh, set uh, description? Because people, uh, in the experiments, you have that 90% um, of people tend to, to so they don't follow the rules of classical probability, but still 10% of people does follow. And they actually, there are many, like I have a database of like 200 experiments, and depending on the way you prepare the experiment, you will have something like 20% of people or 40%, so you have a range, but you never go below 20, 18%. So you will have always 18% of people that will, what they said, commit the fallacy. Oh. So, I was thinking that if you do something like... like I think they are not looking at the same thing because... Yeah, like BB will have to have a, a surface like this to, to have more classical case. You see what I mean? But, but here, I think that the classical thing is to look at the at intersection... The, sorry. At the, sorry. At the intersection of BB with I, yes. which is more or less this, the other intersection of that, and the intersection with both, of course, is smaller. Yes. But the other people are looking at the fit. Yeah. Is there some proof? Uh, no, shift no, no. of people. Yeah. What I meant that was following your model, mm -hmm. and then I say, okay, if your model is right, then we'll also have to be able to model the case where people do not commit the fallacy. By 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 the same, you just changing BB, just giving it another shape to BB. So that the the fitting, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so it, it follows the classical problem, and then you would have to have a structure like like it goes around this, and then high yeah, sure. goes south from this. So but this would be should be much smaller here. Yes, and then much larger inside I and R. 
Yeah. You see what I mean? Yes. Oh. Something like that will follow classical probability. At least uh, uh, in a quantitative way. Because yeah. what is interesting is some people have, you know, I think you did that, have computed, calculated yeah. with a quantum model and they are able to fit the statistical yeah. data. I'll, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. Uh -huh. So then, then I had my, my idea was when I was, when you were explaining this, I followed and I thought, well, let's say that this is a model that works and then oh. what would this mean? What would this type of a structure, which is the classical structure, I mean, the, the structure that follows classical probability, that would mean that there are some, but it, it's a sort of exclusive or situation. So yeah. some bank tellers are either, or where some black belt guys are either, I saw uh, like this, like, they want to be alone, or they are racist, but not both. Yeah, they do. see? Want to. And then the, guy, the case that this happens together should, should be like not so frequent. Yeah. And, and this is a sort of constraint that nature gives when you go to the macroscopic level. That things, mm. when looking at this, the probabilities in this description, you see? Mm. So it's a sort of, uh, well, yeah. it's just a matter for, for reflecting further. But I think maybe that the black American would say, uh, but rather, right? I would bet the Americans do not behave like this. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, but in some cases, this might, might be a reasonable behavior. So it's a, yeah, it's a complex. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting to, okay. to, to stretch the argument and see how different things are. Okay. So, any other question? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have one question. The, how do you think about the difference? Between kind of mechanical approach and kind of like approach. Yeah, you, kind of like. Yeah, you, you use the technology kind of like. Uh, Sorry, I not, didn't use the word, I didn't get it. Between quantum mechanical yeah. approach? One is a quantum mechanical approach and the other one is a quantum like approach. Quantum -like. You use the uh, kind of like approach. Ah, quantum like? Yeah. Um, yeah, and the you know, thing, uh, quantum light is a softer. Uh -huh. It just uh, looks like quantum, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but some people would say the generative uh -huh. is uh -huh. fake quantum. Yeah. It just looks like quantum because what my colleagues did is more or less quantum light. Mm -hmm. They take three dimensional real space and they, there are some unwanted entailments in their model because you have like, three degrees of freedom and in principle you would need four. So I would say this is sort of quantum light. It has some features of quantum uh, mechanics, like uh, uh, probabilities being calculated by squares of amplitudes. Yeah, but this is partial. It's only partial. Yeah. I, I expressed the quantum system in terms of the lattice theory. So that is. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the quantum system with no locality is expressed as a force modular lattice. So it is an almost dissolved system of a brain lattice. But uh, it loses the uh, idea of the Hilbert space. So uh, it is uh, not the same as the Kahneman mechanics. But uh, I think the macroscopic phenomenon uh, of the system is uh, uh, like a soft, uh, soft current uh, mechanics. Probably it loses uh, the idea of the Hilbert space or something like that. And, uh, yeah, and uh, you use the uh, contraction parts you were in the, uh, in the uh, story or uh, at the time. Uh, I think the amplification is served as uh, uh, probability space. So as the contraction parts you were I hope the division can be uh, explained and uh, result uh, Thank you for uh, your talk. Again, we will thank Professor Sotomayor. And now um, we have our last speaker that is ready. If you, we have to set up a little bit the connection. So if you want to take a coffee, but it's just okay, coffee and get back to sit your seat. Because uh, in like two, three minutes, we start with the last lecture. She's already ready.
to, to speak. Um, so we will get back in uh, four, three minutes, four minutes. Nora, people will get a coffee before your talk. She's listening, right? Four minutes. Yeah.